Welcome to our sport. I'm Larry, I'm your host. John, as always, doing the recording, editing, and providing occasional commentary. The 2019 season is officially over, and your champion is the LSU Tigers. So, let's talk about this game. This game was played in New Orleans. Uh, this was a friendly crowd, not overwhelming, but it did favor LSU. And me and John had a debate about who would win. We both thought it would be kind of a close game. And to be honest, this really was not a close game uh, once you could see who the better team was. Clemson started out hot. They did come out with a certain defensive package that um, LSU was not ready for. And the LSU coordinator had mentioned before, it's like this is seven games in a row where people have come out in a defense that they haven't played before against us, and they have to make adjustments on the fly. Well, LSU is capable of it and probably used to doing it by now. And from that point where Clemson led 17-7, LSU outscored them 35-8. to A 35-8 to run, and at the end, they were taking their foot off the gas. They were giving the ball to their fine running back and really could have scored more. Joe Burrow found his rhythm, and he was just phenomenal like he was all year. Um, he's, once that happened, once he got the jitters out of the way, um, once the Android downloaded their defense, he saw what they were doing, and um, they had no answer for him. Nobody's had an answer for him all year. And this remarkable kind of adjustment from last year, this transformation. He was an average quarterback last year. I don't know what happened to him, but we are really talking about perhaps the single greatest quarterback season in most of our memories. I don't want to say things like in the history of college football or something like that, but in recent history, I can think of Cam Newton's one year where he was playing at this absolutely dominant level. Uh, and we've had some fine quarterback years. Uh, Baker Mayfield and Kellen Moore and all of these fantastic. Danny Werfel that we've all seen. Tommy Frazier. But they were not at this level. This is ridiculous how accurate he was. If you watch the LSU offense all year, you'll know how many times that they have three or four or five receivers out on the route. They don't provide Burrow with a lot of protection because he's capable of of utilizing all his weapons. If you take the first read away, he can go to the second, he can go to the third, and it just speaks to his acumen, to his natural ability as a football player. You would think, because it wasn't that this way last year. Either that or Joe Brady is one hell of a coach and it could be a part of it. Also could just be some sort of natural progression. Now, Clemson, um, they did hit him. They did play well. There are some key points that I think were the turning point in this game. I'm not sure if the first two were really going to be the thing that won the game for him, but they didn't help. Um, late in the second quarter, Clemson was on the field on defense, and LSU was facing a third and 19, and Clemson had a penalty and gave them a first down. Was it a penalty, John, or a big catch? It was a it was a egregious pi on Terrence Marshall. He was yep. going to get the first down, but he basically just mauled him before the ball even got there. Right. Okay. A bad penalty. Uh, at the absolute worst time. And then when James Skalski, the fine linebacker, was having a hell of a game and really putting a lot of hits on Burrow, when he got knocked out of the game for a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit, kind of changed the tone, and their defense went down a notch. I don't think either of these things were enough to swing a game. I think what was enough to swing this game, and if you watch, Trevor Lawrence was throwing the ball high over and over and over. Um, I don't know if he was hurt. I have a friend of mine who's a Clemson alum. He's watching the game. He thought that he got hit in the head and might have had a concussion uh, from one of the plays he saw early in the game in the first quarter. Maybe his stance was too wide. Maybe his fundamentals were off. And that's what we're used to seeing from Trevor Lawrence. The highest he had before this in the game were five overthrows. He had 13 in this game. Didn't even hit 50% passing. And if your quarterback is not even going to hit 50% passing against Joe Burrow, you're going to lose that game. You have no chance to beat him. And that's what happened. The 13 overthrows. And, and now if you watch some of those plays that the Clemson receivers are schemed open. They either are schemed open or they're beating their man. They had the talent to do it. So it, it wasn't like it was all of them were contested passes. The plays were there to be made. And for some reason, Trevor Lawrence had a, a rare bad night. 13 passes that went the wrong way. The first two factors might have not been enough to, to turn this game in Clemson's favor. The 13 passes, if they were to completed, they could have kept them in the game all the way to the end. But not what happened. I don't mean to say that 
LSU is not deserving of the win, by the way. I do think LSU is the best team. Um, it's not any kind of criticism on them. It's just, you know, if and that, with the blah, blah, blah. But no, they were the better team. Definitively, you could tell. Jamar Chase was almost unstoppable, 222 yards. And A.J. Terrell, Clemson's corner, was on him most of the game and man coverage early. And he was just beating him. And if you watch, Terrell's a good corner. We said this. And he got open, but he got... He wasn't burning him. He wasn't torching him. He was just barely open. He was not college open. He was NFL open. But Joe Burrow's making NFL throws. So he was as open as he needed to be because Burrow was so pinpoint. And uh, Jesse Jefferson had over 100 yards. Just par for the course. What we've seen all year from this wonderful LSU offense. The balance. The explosive ability. The production, the execution, they just execute at such a high level. Now, you're going to hear some of this. Um, people are talking about, is this the greatest offense of all time? Is this the greatest season of all time? And I don't think it's an insult to LSU if you say this isn't necessarily the greatest offense of all time. It's still a great offense or the greatest team. Um, you could, I think it's up there one of the greatest offenses ever. I certainly think it's, you know, on the Mount Rushmore, on the medal stand where you have to at least talk about it. I don't think it's the greatest team ever because they, they, they face so many teams that end up being ranked in the final top 10. I understand that. But some of those games were close. The Florida game, the Auburn game, those were among others. The, the Alabama game was a five-point contest. Those are close games. But you look at somebody like 2004 USC, for the most part, it just blew everybody out. Oh, USC played Oklahoma in the championship game and beat them 55-19, just hammered them. So that team was a great team and really did not have many close competitors. The 72 USC team who killed everybody. 2001 Miami, 95 Nebraska. I would say those are probably better than this team. Uh, not taking it away from LSU, not at all. A worthy champion, certainly deserving. Now let's talk about what this means in the big picture for these programs. LSU is now a permanent Mount Rushmore powerhouse dynasty, at least for decades, because this is their fourth national championship, and it's with their fourth different coach. So you, they're not, if they even were before this, they're not second tier to Alabama, uh, USC, uh, Ohio State, Notre Dame. They're on their level now. They're on the very top level with the best programs in college football. So, and, and that's going to, that's going to, this has an enduring kind of quality to it when you do it like this. When you have three national championships, I believe, in the last 10 years, um, you are permanently cemented as um, arguably the top team in college football at the moment. It, very much arguably, but you could argue it if you were an LSU fan. For Clemson, Clemson's going to be fine. If you look at their roster... Had 120 players. 80 of these players were freshmen or sophomores. Okay, so Clemson is going to be the preseason number one uh, going into next year, almost certainly, because LSU loses Burrow. They just lost Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator to Carolina. Two huge factors. Uh, Jefferson declared. Michael Divinity declared, I believe. Uh, Patrick Queen declared. This is just at this recording. Guys are just leaving left and right. And... You know, this is kind of normal with a powerhouse program. Alabama's got defections like this with Jerry Judy. But you can't replace Joe Burrow. And you might not be able to replace Joe Brady. So they're going to be good next year. They're recruiting too well. They're well coached. But they can still be great next year and be 10-2 and two because they cannot get this level of quarterback production. You cannot replicate what they had this year. This year was special. That quarterback was special. They're calling him maybe the greatest player in LSU history. And um, I don't know if I'd argue it. I mean, I remember Glenn Dorsey was a tremendous player. He was a top five pick. But, and maybe probably more consistent over his whole, entire career. But what Joe Burrow did was almost unheard of. So, Clemson. Uh, as I said, a very young team. And Trevor Lawrence comes back for them. Uh, T. Higgins has declared for the draft, but Justin Ross is back. Uh, they had some stud freshman receivers come in. And now... They do what they haven't done before, really. They've kind of done this through a process of culture. They've had great players. They've found players under the radar. 
Um, and really, they have, there has been a talent gap if we watch the recruiting rankings. You know, the Michigan Wolverines have more four and five stars than the Clemson Tigers on their roster. Well, that's starting to change because now they have the number one recruiting class in the country coming in, something that has not happened before. And to add on top of this roster, which returns so many players, Clemson is going to be the preseason favorite in almost every poll next year, deservedly so. LSU probably be in the top five. I would imagine in some sort of order, Clemson almost certainly first, Alabama, Ohio State. That's what you look forward to from that program. So John and I are watching this game, and at halftime, uh, they had a list coming up. The 11 greatest players in college football history, according to ESPN. So at halftime, I said, John, I'm going to take a shower. Um, I'll be out. And in the shower, I was thinking about who are these players going to be? I was trying to think who in my head would I pick as the 11 greatest. I'm like, this, this is going to be so cool. And I realized it wasn't. When I was in the shower, I'm thinking. I'm like, the more I realized that this list is just going to make me mad. Um, ESPN has some fine people working at that network. They have some people who are really knowledgeable about college football. But they have a lot of people um, who are not necessarily, you know, do not know what it means when they say the history of college football. Because the history of college football means since it started. It doesn't mean since your memory started. It means since it started. And sure enough, I came out of the shower cranky. I was so excited and my mood turned sour. And I said, let's see this shit. And what do you know? The top 11 players. Nine running backs. You're telling me the nine of the 11 best players in college football history are running backs. Now you had Red Grange and Jim Thorpe. They were in the one platoon era. They were known as running backs. They played on both sides of the ball. But it was Bo Jackson and Herschel Walker. Now I'm not saying these aren't great players. These are great players. That's not what I'm saying. But... You can't do better than that. You can't say that the 11 best players are all running backs. You can't You can't go with somebody like Hugh Green or Bill Fralick or Orlando Pace. And those were awesome players. Um, but no, we're going to have nothing but running backs because all we know is the people have covered the sport is uh, I'm going to go on a rant here. John, stop me. <laughs> well, it's I, just, have, I have the full... 150 players. Oh, yeah. 11, oh. But I have uh, oh, 150. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So even better. So John goes on there on the top 150 players on ESPN. Uh, and this And he starts reading off these players. And then I got really mad. And John, give me number 84. Do you remember? Number 90 is what I think you're... you're no, I'm thinking about number 84. 84. 84. Okay, so I have the list. Um, 84 is Adrian Peterson. Okay, and stop. Now, Let's no, no, no. no sh shut up. Okay. So, Adrian Peterson's on this list. Adrian Peterson is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, oh, shut up. It's an awesome football player, right? We all agreed that. No, no, guess what? Not that Adrian Peterson. <laughs> it looks like. <laughs> From Georgia Southern. Now, I don't want to hurt the guy's feelings. I'm sure he's happy to be on this list. But I saw him play. Are you kidding me? The 84th best player in the history of college football is Adrian Peterson from Georgia Southern? No. No, I'm sorry. The Adrian Peterson from Oklahoma was on there. I'm surprised he's, you know, not behind uh, Adrian Peterson of Georgia Southern. Um, but you have Heisman winners. Heisman winning players who are behind Adrian Peterson of Georgia Southern. People saw his stat line, 6,600 career rushing yards. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm sure he terrified the defenses of Louisiana Monroe. I'm sure he f***ed those teams up pretty good. <laughs> no, but I'll oh, go ahead. You'll read, read me some of the players these after are, him. These are the three direct players directly after. So right after A.J. Peterson. 86, 87. Yeah. In this order. Ted Hendricks. The Mad Stork, Miami. Otto Graham. Northwestern. Steve Young. Steve Young from BYU. Some of y'all are not old enough to remember Steve Young. I remember Steve Young at BYU. All those guys, Robbie Bosco, Jim McMahon, those were great quarterbacks. They were airing the ball out. Ty Detmer, oh, those quarterbacks from BYU alone were better than Adrian Peterson 
From Georgia, I'm sorry, I'm cursing in front of a teenager. I'm sorry, this just drives me crazy. People do not follow the history of football, do not know the history of football, and I don't even know if this whole rant's going on here because I'm sure John's gonna cut her off at some point. This just drove me uh, Steve Spurrier, Drew Brees. These are behind Adrian Peterson? Rod Woodson. These Deshaun, are all behind Adrian Peterson? Deshaun Watson. No, I'm asking. Sid Luckman. I'm asking, seriously. Are they? Junior Seau. Steve Spurrier. Mike Singletary. But one of Heisman. Mike Singletary had 30 tackles in a game. Steve McNair. Rod Woodson, who was six foot two and a track athlete and a first round pick. Aaron McNair from Alcorn State and his 14,000 career Combined yards. Kenny Easley. Kenny, Kenny Easley, All-American from UCLA, a track star. Derek Brooks. And the Hall of Fame, Der Florida State's Derek Brooks. Marcus Marietta. Christian McCaffrey. Marcus Marietta, who won the Heisman. No, no, no. Don't worry about your eyes. Don't let your eyes tell you who's better. <laughs> Warren Sapp. Let's, let's some, let some pencil neck from ESPN, <laughs> let, let some of these stat nerds or whoever the <laughs> is picking this list tell you who the better player is. And uh, this is... This is... <laughs> Kind of a beef with me, you could probably tell. <laughs> I'm dying. Stop laughing. <laughs> I'm dying. Oh, Marcus Mariota, highs of the winner. Don't worry about what you saw. Adrian Peters of Georgia Southern, much better player. Okay, stop the tape. I'm going to punch something. All right, it's me here to do the outro. My father is currently hyperventilating in the other room, trying not to destroy the entire world. So uh, we've been a bit off schedule the past couple of weeks. We're going to be back on schedule this Sunday and hopefully every other Sunday after that. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, there's a like button down there. Show that you support us and you like the video. If you want to be notified of all of our future videos, the subscribe button and the notification bell will give you a little notification, a little ding every time we post. Uh, if you have a topic, coach, player, anything you want us to cover, you can comment it down below. We'll probably talk about it. There's some other ways you can come into contact us with us down in the description box. We have an email, Facebook, Twitter. We're everywhere. Uh, and as always, thank you for watching. Pray. Pray for my father. Adrian Peterson!